pull in. Okay, so February, this is um, a month where bee season is really starting to ramp up. And to me, it's it's so exciting because, I mean, this is kind of what we've, we've all been waiting for, right? I mean, we've all been waiting for bees to start growing and uh, you know, this warm weather to get here. And we've had some really nice warm weather and days in January and then the beginning of February. And we're now finally getting to see uh, our bees grow as a result. And that brings up a number of, you know, interesting management things that we're going to tackle tonight. So before we get started, though, just a quick reminder, if you haven't ordered bees yet, um, go ahead and do that quickly. Our Golden Cordovan Nooks and our Texas 5000 Nooks are selling out really fast this year. Um, faster than the normal, <laughs> thank, thank you. We really appreciate that. That's what helps uh, honestly pay for this type of education. You know, I mean, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't keep doing this type of education um, without you guys and the purchases you make. And so we, we really appreciate that. It uh, keeps food on our tables and uh, lets us pay for stuff like this and, and keep this education free. So much appreciated. Um, just a quick reminder, we do have package bees again this year. You're probably aware of that. That's awesome if you need us to ship you bees with free shipping. Or what I tell people all the time is, you know, if you're local to us, um, nooks or full hives are the best way to get started because you're getting brood, you're getting a, a queen that's already laying, you're getting multiple frames. That's a great way to get started. But if you're not local to us, we'd love to ship them to you. Or packages are also great if you have used equipment and the equipment, um, you know, you've already got, maybe your hive died last year and you've already got comb, then you know, used equipment um, is a great way to package and um, And they, they get started right away um, on that. The great thing packages are for about packages is that you can use them in, um, you can use them in uh, top bar hives. And so if you've got a top bar hive, then they are fantastic uh, to, to use as well. So um, we've also got uh, our new advanced class schedule released. And so if you jump onto our website, then check out our advanced class dates. We try to do something a little different this year. And that is, oops, sorry. That is, we, we are doing an equal number of, of virtual classes and in-person classes. So we always have in-person classes at our branches that you can come and do hands-on out in the bee yard, et cetera. This year, you know, COVID is still here, unfortunately. And so we are, are doing a equal blend of in-person classes and virtual classes. And so you can jump onto our website under virtual advanced classes or just advanced classes to kind of see our schedule, dates, times, prices, et cetera, for all of our virtual classes. The monthly magazine, I'm almost through with announcements here, guys. Uh, Sherry, do you want to jump on and tell us a little bit about this monthly sure. magazine? Sure, I can do that. Hi. Oh, we can't hear you, Sherry. I think you're, uh, I think you're on mute there. I doesn't say I am. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm the one. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. I got it. Yeah. All right. So this month is a good, good. Yeah. James is saying somebody had said something about the volume was low, but I think you sound a little better now. It's uh, kind of been a little itchy tonight. That's all right. We're online. What can you say? So uh, this month's magazine, it's a good one. As always, it's starting to get fuller and fuller because what's happening? Spring is coming. But this month, we've got Varroa treatments uh, in there. Blake wrote a great article on grading bees uh, that are going to California for almond pollination. Um, I did a, a short one on equalizing your bee yard by request from last month's uh, participants for this webinar. So see, bring those questions. We can um, write articles to help you out if you want to hear a topic. Um, ask the experts, and that's going really well. Y'all look at this magazine, it's a good one, and it's going to get better as the spring goes on. We're going to be full of information. How's that? Sounds great. So um, let me, uh, I'm going to try something real quick, guys, and you, I, I apologize. You may just have to bear with me. I'm going to try to get the audio fixed here. 
Sherry, how's that sounding? That sounds better, Blake. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Please. Okay, good. I apologize about that, guys. You know, you get these fancy earbuds and they're supposed to have so much better audio. It only works if you actually uh, turn them on. So who knew? Uh, so if the audio gets bad again, just uh, start start pushing some uh, chats in there and I'll, I'll see it and, and fix my audio. So you guys miss them really, you know, that, that's just how it works. I was trying to do all these sales pitches and tell you about all the great stuff we're selling and all our new classes and you couldn't hear it. So, oh, well, <laughs> the, uh, the last thing to mention is our virtual spring split class. We have a bunch of these, but the, the soonest one is March the 6th and that's a virtual one. We have in-person ones at all of our branches uh, a little bit later in March. We tried to bump all our split classes up a little bit because we want you to have plenty of time to know exactly what you're doing, get Queens ordered, et cetera. So our very first splits class is March 6th, um, about a month away, 29 bucks. And uh, it's, it's virtual, but you'll be able, we'll be showing videos and showing you the recording afterwards and it'll, it'll be really interactive. So. Okay, let's talk bees. So February tip. So spring is almost sort of kind of here. I mean, the bees are acting like spring is getting rolling. The temperature, depending on the uh, hour in some cases, sometimes does and sometimes doesn't actually feel like it. Uh, one thing that you see in the background of this picture, this was uh, last month in January. This is an, a blooming elm tree. And last month we said, hey, this is what we're waiting for. We're waiting for this elm tree to start blooming. And, uh, and now it is, it started blooming uh, in most areas of the state and the South even in late January, most places it's in, in the South, it's in full bloom now. And this is the best early pollen source across much of the South even. Um, it's, a, as you know, it's an elm tree, it blooms. I don't believe the bees get any nectar off of it, but they get a tremendous amount of pollen when it when it blooms. And it's that kind of that, um, I'm gonna call it a light orange colored pollen that the bees just haul in left and right on warm days. And this is kind of kickstarting the spring season for us. And, and so that's in full bloom. When it's warm enough for the bees to forage on it, they're bringing in bucket loads of pollen off of it. So that is super exciting. That's what really, gets those bees to start growing and we're seeing it blooming right now. Other than that, um, we're kind of seeing the same things blooming that we talked about in January, which is kind of these early, early, well, really late winter blooms. And, and you're seeing the dandelions are only increasing in blooms. If you have a yard that you mow frequently, you've noticed that the dandelions are everywhere. And uh, you're seeing the hen bit is blooming and in ever, ever increasing quantities. And then that far left picture, that wild mustard, it's really not supposed to be blooming yet, but we are getting some early blooms of that. You know, we usually see that a lot, blooming a lot more in, uh, in early March is when that really starts kicking in early to mid March. So, um, but we're still seeing some of that bloom and that's a great nectar and pollen source for the bees. So not a lot of new things coming into bloom, but some of these existing ones are blooming more and more. And through the month of February, we'll see more things come online and, and start blooming. So in general, when it's a nice warm day and the bees can fly, there's pollen for the bees to gather. Now, after this coming week, that may not be the case as much. We're getting some very, very cold weather this week. And we'll be talking about the implications this, this next week, excuse me. We'll talk about the implications of that on your bees. Current conditions, what we're seeing right now is that brood rearing is dramatically ramping up. You know, bees have gone from, you know, in January, we were often seeing a little handful of eggs and larvae. Now in some hives, we're seeing multiple frames of brood, not everywhere, and we'll talk about that. We're seeing a strong pollen flow in most areas, weather permitting. I mean, really in, the, in much of the South, you know, I, I've not talked to many beekeepers that aren't seeing a pollen flow at this point on, on those warm days when the bees are able to forage. The temperature is certainly a roller coaster. You know, we had some really nice warm weather. And now next week, you know, depending on where you are in the state, I mean, I, I live in North Texas and we're gonna be down in the teens at night and in the thirties during the day, I was talking, I was looking, I, I, I watched the weather all over the state and, and uh, <laughs> when you're a beekeeper, 
especially for a living. Um, we don't look at the uh, stock market as much as we look at the weather. And so uh, a beekeeper's stock market is essentially the weather. And so the most used app on my phone is uh, the weather folder where I've got about 10 different weather apps where I'm watching weather all across the country constantly. And, and that's, the, uh, that's the stock market for me. So um, all across the state of Texas right now, you know, we're definitely going to see some uh, pretty cold weather for a pretty extended period of time next week. And, and we're certainly going to get into what you should be doing with your bees to prepare for that. You know, the last thing is just bee flight and feed implications uh, based on the current conditions. And we're going to we're going to get into all that. This is what I'm seeing inside my hives right now in February. And of course, it's very dependent on the strength of the hive. You know, if you've got a weak hive that's three or four frames of bees, you may only be seeing that little knot of brood. But if you've got a hive that's a deep box completely full of bees or more, uh, I'm seeing a couple frames of brood plus in those hives right now, depending on the strength and the population of that hive. So these are just some images that I snapped. I mean, some of these hives you can see, I've got this you know ring of pollen already forming on those good days when bees are bringing that pollen in. They've got a ring of pollen. They've got brood, the queen's starting to lay kind of around that pollen. And in some cases, I've got some pretty good patterns of brood already in, in hives. Again, um, these, are, these are from some pretty strong hives. <laughs> and uh, if you, it, It's funny because in general, if you follow a lot of beekeeping pages and social media pages, they're always posting the best pictures of the best looking hives. And uh, that's not always reality. So these were pictures from some really good hives, uh, weaker hives, did not have this much brood and that's that's okay. You're gonna see cleansing flights and orientation flights, you know, when it's been cold for three or four days and the bees couldn't fly and all of a sudden you get a warm day, two things are happening now. You're getting pent up uh, demand from the bees to need to go on a cleansing flight. And then you're also getting uh, an orientation flight where all the new baby bees that were hatching out also need to go out and fly. So you can have some really intense bursts of activity once that weather does warm up and the bees have been cooped up inside. A lot of folks have questions of, hey, are, is my hive getting robbed because <laughs> there's all this activity or are they just going on a cleansing or orientation flight? And, you know, the best way to really tell is a, a couple things. And I, I, I'm going on a rabbit trail, so I don't have pictures to show you and I apologize. But one of the key things I look for when a hive is being robbed is, is there a bunch of debris on the entrance and the bottom board. If there's a bunch of debris, you know, wax cappings, et cetera, that's when I know it's probably getting robbed because those robber bees are inside that hive, tearing open that honey, dropping the wax cappings. That's a red alert to me. And, and I'm not talking a couple little pieces of debris, I'm talking a layer of debris. Another thing I look for is are bees trying to get into all the cracks and crevices in a hive? You know, if they're trying to get up under the lid, you know, bees are trying to get between the boxes. That's a classic sign of robbing. If you just got no debris and a whole bunch of bees coming and going without fights uh, from the entrance, especially if the bees haven't been able to fly for a few days, probably just a cleansing flight, orientation flight. We've got some videos on our YouTube channel too. You can go check out if you wanna see what robbing looks like. It's pretty dramatic. Okay, so feeding. So what's going on with feeding in, in February, especially with the cold weather that's coming up, uh, you know, it's pretty simple. I mean, feed as needed to maintain about a 20 pound surplus of stores in your second brood box. And this is a big caveat that I'm going to start adding all the time now when I talk about how much honey a hive needs extra is that 20 pound surplus is for a hive that is at least one deep box full of bees or more. Now, if your hive is, you know, again, half a deep box full of bees, you know, they don't need three or four deep frames of honey in the bottom and 20 plus pounds of honey stored in the second box. They really don't need that much food because there's not that many bees. They may only need, you know, a couple frames full of honey. Uh, so if you've got two deep boxes full of bees, I, I kind of want more like 30 to 40 pounds of honey up in that second box. So, you know, it, it is hive and population dependent. On average, I'm going for about 20 pounds of surplus stores in your second box for the month of February for kind of your average deep box full of hive. Deep box full 
hive strength. And, and, you know, this is where you just have to look at your hive a little bit and make that judgment call. You can switch to one-to-one -one syrup feeding. We've been talking, you know, ever since, you know, really late summer, we've been feeding two-to-one syrup. Now I encourage folks to switch over to one-to-one -one syrup if you do need to feed, if your hive does need food, then switch over to that one-to-one -one syrup. We can start using that to stimulate uh, brood rearing and comb drawing. And, uh, you know, it's okay to start making that transition. I still recommend using a division board feeder or top feeder instead of an entrance feeder because bees can get pretty robby with those entrance feeders. And honestly, I, here, here's the deal with entrance feeders. They're really fun for brand new beekeepers and convenient because uh, you can refill the syrup jar without entering the hive. And it's kind of fun to see how quickly the bees suck down the syrup out of that entrance feeder. Other than that, I'm not a really big fan of entrance feeders. <laughs> so they can really induce robbing because you know it's a lot of syrup right on the front of the hive. So I, I don't discourage them, especially during you know April, May, June, as you have a brand new hive and you're doing a lot of feeding. It's fun and can be educational. Outside of that though, I usually try to push people to division board feeders, top feeders, some, some form of internal feeder. The bees can just access it faster and it doesn't cause robbing as much. Final thing on syrup feeding, you know, check two to three times through February to make sure your bees have enough food. Uh, you know, you don't have to be out there every week, but uh, you know, if you're high, this is especially true if you have a really strong hive, because if you've got, you know, a deep box full of bees or two deep boxes full of bees, there's really not much nectar coming in in most areas right now. And so if they've got, you know, four or five plus frames of brood, they can eat food really fast. So those stronger hives, you're gonna to need to check a little more frequently. You know, if you've got four or five frames of bees and a, you know 40 pounds of honey up on the second box, you're not gonna to need to feed the rest of the year probably. I mean, I'm, you're not gonna to need to feed the rest of the spring, they've got plenty of food. So again, kind of depends on population a bit there. Pollen patties in February. So in general, pollen patties are not needed in February there's enough pollen, natural pollen coming in. However, kind of what we've been saying is watch for those cold weeks and feed pollen patties as necessary. Now, this is where we kind of get into what we're looking at in the upcoming week. It's kind of a, a classic example of what I've been talking about the last few months of, you know, especially if you're in Southeast Texas or, uh, you know, areas that are a bit warmer than maybe North Texas, you may have multiple frames of brood in your hives right now. You know, there some hives in North Texas do too. If you've got multiple frames of brood in your hive and it's a really strong hive, they've been bringing in pollen left and right to grow that brood. We're about to have in most of the Southern United States in mid-February, essentially, we're about to have a week plus where the bees aren't gonna be able to fly. On top of that, we're about to get some hard freezes in a lot of regions that are gonna kill back a lot of those plants that were producing pollen. So it's gonna kind of be a double whammy. Not only are the bees not gonna be able to forage for a week or more in most areas, we're also about to see a lot of our for early spring forage killed. Now that's normal. I mean, it's, not, it's normal to get hard freezes in February, but what that does is it means that the bees aren't gonna be able to go out and get pollen for that brood currently in the hive. And even once they can go out and forage, it's probably gonna take a number of days for some of those plants to start producing pollen again after they've been frozen back. So this is one of those cases where in the next, you know, I don't know how many, I think that cold front's coming in early next week, you know, before early next week, four really strong hives that are already growing a lot of brood, before that cold front hits, I'd go throw a pollen patty in those hives. And what that's going to do is it's going to let them keep rearing and sustaining that brood through the cold week until that pollen flow starts again. So this is one of those cases. Again, it's not like your hive's gonna die if you don't do it. Uh, it's, they're not gonna die, but they probably are gonna start cannibalizing some brood and they're not gonna be able to grow quite as well. So throwing that pollen patty in there guards against that. So um, let's talk a bit about um, February varroa mice. So let me throw this out there. Testing is always important, but most hives don't have levels of varroa mites that require action in February. In fact, many hives won't have high levels of varroa mites until summer. So 
if you tested, you know, if you, or if you read our uh, monthly tips in our TBS monthly magazine, I went into this in a little more detail, but in general, if you had low mic counts, you know, under two per hundred, when you last tested in, you know, I'm going to say November or December, you're still not going to have high mites because there hasn't been enough brood reared for those mites to get out, you know, get beyond, uh, you know, a couple mites per hundred bees. So if you had low, low mites last fall or over the winter, you still shouldn't have a mite problem. Now, if you went into winter with six mites per hundred bees, <laughs> you're going to have a problem and you need to do a February test. But I'm going to say that probably 90% of beekeepers don't need to test um, excuse me, don't need to treat in February. In fact, I would say the majority, maybe not 90%, but the majority of beekeepers don't even have to treat in spring at all. They don't have to treat until, uh, you know, summer after they harvest honey. So um, let that reassure you a little bit that, you know, you don't have to run out there and, and start, you know, treating your hives for most beekeepers. But I would encourage, I would encourage sometime in the month of February, or early March, do a test, make sure your levels are under control. And if they're, you know, if they're one or might or less in February or March, you're probably not gonna have to treat until summer. So um, that being said, if you have, if you do test in February or March and you've got two mites or more per hundred bees, then you do need to consider some form of treatment. If there isn't a whole lot of brood in your hive, then oxalic acid, hop guard, and formic acid are great options. I will tell you that, and this can be a little controversial, but the science proves it over and over and over. Oxalic acid, um, formic acid uh, are just not very effective when there's a lot of brood in the hive because they don't kill the mites inside the brood. And so um, even if you do multiple treatments of those acids, it still doesn't have a great efficacy when there's a lot of brood in the hive. So if, they, if you've got multiple frames in the brood, of brood in the hive, you're probably gonna have to rely on some form of an Apivar or Apigard treatment if you've already got a lot of brood in the hive and you have mites that need to be treated. So, um, and don't forget this chart. You know, we've talked a lot about it uh, in the fall, but I think it's worth putting up here again, you know, just to, to remind us all of when Varroa mites are the, you know, typically for most hives, the greatest threat. You know, you can see it kind of follows the growth of a beehive, you know, and the varroa mites reproduce and brood. So when the hive is growing with brood, those varroa mites grow right along with it. And then they peak. And then as the bees uh, brood rearing declines, the varroa mite levels decline right along with it. Okay, um, just for the fun of it, uh, let's, touch on something that always proves to be um, fascinatingly controversial. Um, let's talk a little bit about treatment-free beekeeping uh, and, and specifically as it relates to varroa mites. So there's four main methods of mite, and I put control in parentheses. Uh, one is no control. So there's groups of beekeepers that don't do any treatment or uh, don't do anything to control varroa mites. And I put control kind of in parentheses because what they're doing is they're relying on genetics, breeding, survival of the fittest to uh, essentially develop a bee, bees, a breed that is resistant to varroa mites, resistant enough to survive without uh, manipulation by the beekeeper. Now, I would kind of say that genetics and breeding is manipulation, um, but in a very uh, hands-off way. So that's kind of one way to control varroa mites. Now, uh, that method, though it is possible, um, takes a number of years of breeding. It takes genetic breeding. Um, it takes a lot of requeening. You have to be willing to sustain heavy, you know, 80 plus percent losses for a number of years and all the while intentionally breeding uh, survivor stock and raising essentially queens um, to do that in order to be successfully treatment-free um, with your, well, I'm gonna say to be able to have bees that rely on nothing but genetics to be mite-free. So it is possible. Um, 
it, it, it it's, takes a lot of commitment and a lot of dedication. And it's not for someone that is brand new in the world of beekeeping or just has a couple hives in their backyard. Um, um, I'm actually a part of a lot of trials right now on a commercial level uh, to try to pull this off and make it more widely available. A lot of promise there, but again, it's not, not for the faint of heart. Um, the second method is treat of chemical free of control and varroa mites. So this is relying on non-chemical controls like drone frames, powdered sugar, et cetera. So not using chemicals, but still stepping in to help control varroa mites. Um, this is very possible. And uh, I've, I've been performing a lot of internal studies personally on this, talking to a lot of researchers, a lot of beekeepers, and have uh, some pretty exciting things I'm very excited about to share soon on this, but it is possible to keep bees chemical free. Um, the other is chemical controls, and this is anything like oxalic acid from from as natural to oxalic as from as natural as oxalic acid all the way to Athabar, you know, which is a synthetic chemical. So any any range in there, they're all chemicals, some more natural than others. And then the fourth is really integrated pest management, which is really relying on a combined tiered approach to all of these. So um, next. You know, that begs the question. I want to address a couple things here. And I promise there's a reason we're getting into all this in February. And I will share it. Um, but what, what kind of beekeeper are you as you kind of think through the different methods of mite control? If you're a brand new beekeeper, you know, if this is your first or second year, um, then it's, I don't encourage first and second year beekeepers to try to control varroa mites using strictly genetics uh, or, you know, even necessarily chemical free methods, because frankly, if you're in your first couple of years of beekeeping, you're just trying to learn when to put a super on. You're trying to learn how to requeen a hive. You're trying to learn how to find a queen. You're, you're trying to learn the very basics of beekeeping and you're trying to keep your bees alive. And when you've really learned beekeeping on a base level, then I think is a great time to begin transitioning into maybe more chemical free approaches experienced beekeepers who have been doing this a long time can already, I think, transition to more chemical free approaches quite easily. Um, you also have to ask yourself, is this a hobby versus a passion? If this is a hobby and it's something you're doing with a couple hives in your backyard, um, that's very different than if this is a true passion of yours and you're willing to go to a whole lot of effort to keep your bees chemical free because chemical free might uh, control is possible but it takes a lot more dedication, effort and work. And so you've got to be realistic with yourself. You know, am I really going to put the time and effort involved that's required to keep my bees alive chemical free or in reality, am I not going to do that? If you're not going to do it, then I'd say, well, use some form of chemical treatment, whether it's oxalic acid all the way to apple bar to keep your bees alive um, rather than just letting your bees die because most beehives will die without some intervention by the beekeeper in some level. Genetics just aren't there yet. Um, I, have, I have tried every queen breeder that offers, almost literally every queen breeder that offers, you know, uh, treatment free bees or, you know, varroa sensitive hygiene bees. Um, I'm a part of several major studies and I always encourage buying queens and bees that are bred for varroa sensitive hygiene. Absolutely encourage it. Um, it's what I sell. It's what Texas Bee Supply sells. It's what we breed. It's what I encourage. However, the vast majority of the time, they aren't good enough to withstand um, varroa mites on their own without some form of intervention. Now that could be chemical free intervention. It could be brood breaks. It could be, you know, frequent requeening, um, but they need usually uh, something else. And, and there are exceptions to that. You know, certainly some people get uh, VHS queens and they put them in a hive and they don't treat and they thrive, but that is a bit of an exception to the rule. I think we're going to get there as an industry. I think we're going to get there to the point where, hey, bees are commercially, uh, or, you know, not just commercially, but bees are in the are available that you can put in your hive and not worry about mites anymore. I think we're going to get there. Some of the studies are just really promising. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet. So prove me wrong, please. If you do, that's going to be fantastic. 
that's best for the industry. My encouragement to you at this point is no matter where you buy queens from, from myself, from anybody else, test and watch those mite levels. Because the other factor is your hive, your queen could always die and they, your hive could always raise a new queen. And when that happens, those genetics, uh, the VHS genetics die very quickly, um, that they, they dilute very quickly. So all of that to say, um, I'm putting together with some other, a few other people, a virtual early, a virtual class in early summer. Um, it's already up on our website under advanced classes. You can sign up for it. Um, it's cheap, 29 bucks, but I'm putting together a virtual class that addresses exactly in the South how to accomplish rural mite control from a genetic, gene, using just genetics, uh, chemical free methods, chemical control methods, and IPL methods, and kind of breaking and simplifying all those down to the point where, hey, this time of year, use this treatment, and this is the results you're going to get. Because, you know, I'm sure half of you are just confused by the, all the stuff I just said. Varroa mite control is very confusing, yet incredibly important. And so um, in that class, and we're developing a handful of charts to go along with it, we're going to try to just incredibly simplify varroa mite control. And after that class, we're gonna have some charts that you should just be able to glance at for any one of those categories to know, hey, here's how to control varroa mites if I wanna be chemical free. I need to do this, this, and this at these intervals at this time of year, and it's gonna deal with mites. Um, same with chemical controls. If I wanna use oxalic acid, here's the time of year, here's how to do it, here's the results. So, um, anyway, I'll move on from varroa mites, but uh, what we're really trying to work on doing is simplifying and shedding some light on each one of those methods and how to accomplish them in a very realistic manner um, that, that kind of gets rid of um, a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the myth perhaps or the uh, mystery is a better word around some of those things. So. Um, okay, moving on. <laughs> uh, if you have questions around some of that, feel free to shoot them to the help at TexasBeastSupply.com. I know it's, it's a tough topic. It can be a controversial topic. Um, but anyway, uh, rediscovering sticky boards. So um, this is uh, one thing I wanted to touch on briefly before we get into some non varroa mite stuff. Because I'm sure you're all sick of varroa mites, just like I am. I get so tired of varroa mites, but it's, it's a big deal. Uh, this is something that you may or may not be aware of, and this can really simplify testing for varroa mites. You all probably know how to do the alcohol wash. We've got a lot of videos on YouTube. We've talked about it, We've shown videos on here. Sticky boards, if you're not aware, there's a picture of one of them there. They insert underneath your screen bottom board, or if you don't have a screen bottom board, directly into the hive entrance with a protection screen over the sticky board, like you see in the image there. So you can stick this underneath your hive, let it sit for 24 hours, pull it out after 24 hours and count how many varroa mites are stuck on that sticky board. And there you go, you just tested your hive for mites. And it's a whole lot easier than the alcohol wash or the powdered sugar roll and you're not killing bees, you're not opening the hive and it gives you a pretty decent count of varroa mites. A couple caveats to keep in mind, like with everything, um, you don't want to inspect the hive while this is inserted in there. And in fact, you don't want to inspect the hive within about a day of it being in there, because what you're trying to get a feel for is the natural varroa mite fall off of worker bee, off of worker bees. And if you're out there manipulating the hive, you're probably going to cause more varroa mites to fall off the bees than would naturally. The other thing is this doesn't work very well in the winter uh, or when the bees are really clustered. This works well um, when the hive is largely active during the day and there's a decent amount of brood in the hive. So I wouldn't really recommend it for February. I would recommend this when daytime temperatures are on average routinely, at least in the mid to upper 60s with a decent amount of consistency. If the hive's clustered all the time, you're not gonna really get a very natural mite count. But realistically, for the southern states between March and you know October, this works pretty well. You can see on the bottom here for the springtime, 
if you have over nine mics on that sticky board after being in there 24 hours, it means you need to take action. In the summer, if you have over 11 mics in 24 hours, you need to take action. So um, I just wanna, I, I wanna throw this out there because we talk a lot about alcohol washes and, and alcohol washes, I'm gonna throw this out there too, are more accurate. The most accurate way to get your grow mite counts is an alcohol wash. But if you follow those parameters here for sticky boards, it's accurate enough to give you a pretty good feel for um, where you are. Now, if you, uh, if you get, you know, eight <laughs> on that sticky board in the springtime, I'd probably do an alcohol wash, you know, cause that you're, you're so, you're toeing the line so much. I'd probably do an alcohol wash just to make sure uh, and get a more accurate count. But, you know, if you put this in there following these parameters and you get two, I wouldn't be worried about grow mites. If you get 15, okay, you've definitely got a problem. So if you're, if you're right on the line, may not hurt to do an alcohol wash. Um, this is what they look like if uh, they don't have that protective cover over them. This is a sticky board without that protective cover. Um, if you have a screen bottom board, you can just insert this uh, sticky board without that black protective cover right underneath your screen bottom board. Um, the screen on your screen bottom board kind of acts like that protective cover. So you can just stick this right underneath your screen bottom board. And as those row mites fall through the screen, they'll stick onto the sticky board and uh, you don't need that protective cover at all. Now, one other quick thing. Uh, if, you are, uh, if you are lucky enough <laughs> to have one of the Texas Bee Supply uh, screen bottom boards, and uh, I'll, I'll admit lots of screen bottom boards come with this. But uh, if you have this, plas this uh, foam board insert that came with a screen bottom board, there's something really cool you can do with that. You can turn it into a sticky board so that that insert that so conveniently slides up under that uh, up under that screen, what you can do is you can take uh, Crisco or petroleum jelly or vegetable oil and clean off that insert so it's nice and clean and then put a very thin smear, a thin layer of any one of those products on it, insert it into the hive, uh, insert it into the screen bottom board insert and you've got a sticky board. Leave it in there 24 hours, pull it out, count your grow mites, wash off or clean off all the, the oil you just put onto that and uh, you can use it again. So those inserts are good for kind of creating your own sticky board. This is a picture of an insert where I did this too and um, I left it in there a lot longer than 24 hours. <laughs> you wouldn't normally see this much debris on that, but you can see I zoomed up on this picture and uh, check out the mites. You know, you can see those little red evil varroa mites uh, all over that, all over that sticky board. So it does, it works great. Uh, and and I, I'd really recommend you try it, especially if you're running screen bottom boards and you've got that insert. If you don't, uh, or if that insert's really grimy and torn up, then just, you know, we, we have them. I, I told them at the store to uh, really stock up in case they get a flood of sticky board orders tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, you can just get those sticky boards and, and use them to gauge mite counts. Okay, enough on varroa mites. Overcrowded in February. This is surprisingly common for a, a lot of folks. There's often a couple extremes. You know, we're either, our bees are barely hanging on in February and we've only got a couple frames of bees left, or I've had a lot of folks say, my beehives are full of bees. What do I do? It's months from splitting season. So if your hive is overcrowded and it's February, number one, that's a great problem. Well done. I mean, that is, that is the goal of beekeeping. You just accomplished it. So having an overcrowded hive in February means you just knocked it out of the park in, in beekeeping. So when the top box on a hive becomes 80% full of bees, it's time to do something because you're at risk of swarming starting now. You know, in February, if your top box is 80% full, then you need to take action. Now, one action I didn't put on this list because I forgot until just now is if your top box is 80% full and your bottom box is empty, then you need to just reverse boxes. Check out our January recording of this webinar on our website under uh, monthly webinars or on our YouTube channel 
And James and Sherry went to great length last month talking about how to reverse boxes. So if it's just your top box that's full and your bottom box is empty, check out that webinar. You just need to reverse boxes. But assuming that both boxes are full and that top box is to the point where it's 80% full, then you've got three options. You can split your hive, you can add boxes, or you can equalize. Now, I guess you've got a fourth option, which is do nothing and your bees will probably swarm, but I'm gonna assume that you don't want that to happen. So let's take a look at those real quick. So February splits. Some folks say, well, hey, if your, if your hive gets full in February, time to make a split. I don't recommend that. And here, here's the reasons. Number one, you can't buy queens this time of year. It's very hard to, let me rephrase that. You can sometimes get queens from Hawaii <laughs> this time of year, but the vast majority of those are booked up by commercial beekeepers that have been on the waiting list for a year. So it's very hard to get queens out of Hawaii this early in the year. So it, in the continental United States, nobody's selling mated queens in February. So you can't get queens. So you say, well, I'll let my bees raise their own queen when I make a split. Well, allowing bees to raise their own queen is slow, takes them a lot longer, which means your hive gets weaker. And it's a risky process, especially this time of year. One of the reasons is you've got the potential for insufficient drones to mate with the queen. A lot of hives just don't have enough drones yet. Now, a lot of hives are starting to rear drones, but remember, it takes 24 days for a drone to hatch. And then it takes two plus weeks for that drone to mature enough to mate. So just because you've got drone brood in the hive doesn't mean that there's sufficient quantities of drones out there to mate with the queen. And another thing is that inclement weather, uh, there's plenty of that this time of year. <laughs> and if a virgin queen doesn't mate within two weeks, she typically becomes a drone layer. She never mates and she starts laying unfertilized eggs. And it's not at all uncommon this time of year to have two weeks of poor weather. And I don't just mean you know, below 50 degrees, but if it's really windy, the queen won't go out to mate. If it's just chilly, the queen often won't go out to mate. So that's not uncommon. So your odds of them raising their own queen successfully in February, pretty slim. The exception here, when I would recommend a split, is if your hive has swarm cells. If your hive is preparing to swarm, if they're on the verge of swarming, and I don't mean emergency queen cups. Now remember, Queen cups are the little emergency queen cells in the hive that if you open them up with your hive tool, there's nothing inside of them. A queen cell is when there is a developing larva inside of it. Swarm cells are usually along the edges of frames, the bottom of frames. So if you've got a hive that's packed full of bees and they've got queen cells all over the place that have larva, developing larvae inside of them, your hive's going to swarm no matter what. At that point, the only way to stop a hive from swarming is to do a split. You know, I, I've seen plenty of folks that say, well, I'll put, a, I'll put a queen excluder between the bottom board and the bottom box, I'll cage the queen, et cetera, et cetera. In general, those things just don't work. When a hive wants to swarm, they're gonna swarm. I've seen hives crawl out of the hive with a queen that couldn't fly <laughs> when they wanted to swarm. So the only real reliable, consistent way to prevent a hive from swarming when once they've got swarm cells is to go ahead and make a split. So if you're at that point, okay, I would go ahead and make a split in February and just hope that that queen can mate successfully um, because that's the only way you're really gonna prevent them from, from swarming anyway. Otherwise, I wouldn't do a split. Um, adding boxes. So this is what I do recommend. So if you've got that hive that's completely full, what I do recommend is adding those are extra boxes. So again, when that top box becomes 80% full, add another box. My personal favorite is adding a deep box of foundation, so under on comb on top, and then just start lightly feeding. You know, maybe give them a couple, you know, a couple quarts a week of light syrup. And what you'll often find is, you know, they'll they'll slowly draw that foundation out. The foundation is also going to slow them down a little bit because it takes time to draw that foundation out. And uh, it, it'll give them room, but they're gonna have to work for it. And it'll kind of put the brakes a bit on that growth. And by the time you can get a queen to split in early April, you'll probably have three deep boxes all full of bees and brood, and you'll be able to make a bazillion splits <laughs> out, of, out of that triple deep hive. Um, if you wanna get more details on making splits, then 
you can join one of our in-person or virtual class is on splits that are coming up. And then, like I said, you can plan to, to split once you can get Queens in early April. So that's what I recommend doing. The other thing I do recommend is equalizing the hives. Now we're gonna spend a few minutes on this because it's something that is really helpful to know year round, not just right now, but it works quite well as a way to prevent hives from swarming. Um, and that is sharing some of the resources out of that really strong full hive to your weaker hives. You can share brood, you can share honey, and I'm gonna tell you how to share bees. Now, there are some prerequisites here. If you're sharing brood or bees, the donor hive needs to have very low mite levels. The last thing you wanna do is spread a bunch of mites around to the rest of your hives. Um, so you need to have low mite levels. So you know under two per hundred uh, of, of, uh, uh, during a mite test. You, if you're sharing brood bees or honey, you wanna make sure you don't have brood disease. So you wanna make sure the brood looks healthy in the hive. You don't wanna see any yellow twisted brood. You don't wanna see you know, those chalk brood mummies. You wanna have good healthy brood because you don't wanna transfer diseases. Oftentimes if your hive is that good and that strong, they're pretty healthy. Um, the other prerequisite is you wanna make sure you leave the original donor hive at least one box full of bees this time of year. So you don't wanna pull so many bees or so much resources away that they're less than that box full of bees. And for a hive that needs resources or for a hive you're giving resources out of, you wanna gauge the strength on a warm day over 60 degrees. Because you know if it's colder than that, you can have hives tightly clustered and it's hard to get a feel for, are you taking too many bees or brood away? Or you know that hive that seems weaker, maybe they don't actually need it because they're stronger than you thought. So make those assessments and that equalization on, on warmer days. Um, so equalizing brood, here's how you wanna do it. It's real simple. Select frames of mostly capped brood from a strong hive. And I say cap brood because when you're giving cap brood from a stronger hive to a weaker hive, um, cap brood doesn't need as much care. The bees have already nursed those bees along and capped it. And now in your weaker hive, they don't have to have enough bees to feed all those larvae. They only need enough to keep it warm. So I like doing cap brood when I'm equalizing hives. So I shake the bees off of that frame of brood then I add that frame of brood to the center of the brood nest on the weaker hive between other frames of brood. You don't want to stick that frame of brood out on one edge because it'll get too cold at night. You want it right in the heart of activity in that weaker hive. You want to make sure that hive has enough bees to fully cover that new frame of brood. So you wouldn't want to take a frame of brood that looks like this in the picture and give it to a hive that is two frames of bees because they're not going to have, they're not going to be able to keep it warm. Uh, and so make sure they've got at least enough population to cover that brood and keep it warm. And then you only want to add really one frame of brood at a time to weaker hives. You don't want to give them three frames of brood or two frames of brood because they're not usually going to have enough bees to keep it warm. So one frame at a time and then place the frame back in the original hive. It, you know, you've got to, you, you pulled a frame out of your donor hive, right? So you got to put a frame back in to replace it. It can be an empty frame and I usually put it on the outside edge of that original donor hive. I don't put an empty frame right back in the middle of the hive this time of year, especially because you wanna keep, always keep brood together and not have it separated by an empty frame of comb, foundation, honey, et cetera. On these cold nights, the bees need to be able to cluster around all that brood and keep it warm and a, an empty frame right in the middle of that disrupts and breaks that cluster apart. And you don't have to just, you know, when you're, when you're intentionally you can equalize brood or anything to help boost up weaker hives. But if you've got a hive that's too strong at this time of year, you know, you don't have to just give resources to weaker hives to help the weaker hive. You can do it just to get rid of brood out of your strong hive. So if you've got a hive that's two deep boxes full of bees and brood, and you've got another hive that's one deep box full of bees and brood, well, you can still take resources from that best one and give them to the other hive um, just to keep that strongest hive from swarming. So Equalization and sharing a brood doesn't just have to be to try to save a weaker hive. It can be to equalize and, and 
equalize strength across your apiary to prevent swarms too. Um, equalizing honey. So this one isn't as common, you know, but you can do it. You know, if you've got one hive with a ton of extra honey and other hives that need honey, you know, you can uh, select a frame of honey, shake the bees off, add it to the outside edge of the cluster or brood area in the new hive. So what, what that means is when you, when you open up the hive you're giving that honey to, you wouldn't wanna, again, put it right in the center because then you're breaking apart the brood nest. You would wanna put it right on the edge of the cluster. So kind of like right on the edge of where the brood starts. That way the bees have quick access to it if they need that brood. Um, it's not so far away they can't get to it, but you're not breaking up that brood nest if that makes sense. And then uh, same principle for replacing a frame in the, in the previous hive. Okay, the other one that isn't as common that most a lot of folks haven't tried or heard of um, is equalizing bees. So you can actually share bees between hives. Now, you don't, I don't like, you know, putting a frame covered with bees into a hive because that often causes fighting. But what I've done many times and seen it work countless times is you can get a frame of, uh, a frame from your strong donor hive that is covered with bees and has larva inside that frame. So get a frame covered with bees that's got a lot of developing larva inside of it. What that's gonna mean is that most of the bees on that frame are going to be nurse bees. Nurse bees uh, join a new hive the quickest and easiest with the least amount of fighting. So select a frame out of your brood nest covered with bees with open brood on it. Make sure the queen's not on that frame. Very important, uh, find her elsewhere in the hive or just look at that frame very carefully and make sure she's not on that frame. Smoke the entrance of your weaker hive that you're about to donate bees to, to get those guard bees to run in and then shake that frame of bees off into the entrance or onto the entrance of that weaker hive. And those, those nurse bees are gonna walk into that hive and typically with virtually no fighting. And then you can repeat that with up to three frames of bees from a stronger hive. Um, be sure that you're leaving that stronger hive again with at least enough bees to cover whatever brood they've got. Um, but it works really well. And so if you've got a hive that needs some bees and you've got a hive that got too many bees, that's a great way to do some bee equalizing uh, between, between hives. Okay, almost done here. And then we'll get to swarm traps, which is what the Elums are gonna talk about tonight. And that is uh, one thing to touch on is hive inspections, you know, what to expect for February. <laughs> I know this is a massive range, two to eight frames of brood is what you're gonna see in most hives, you know, and that's region and hive population dependent. You know, weaker hives will have less than two, but there's a huge variety in the amount of brood in hives right now. And so, you know, again, I've seen some hives that have half a frame, some hives that are bursting at the seams. And so you've got that huge uh, variety and that's why sometimes equalizing is helpful. You know, if you've got multiple hives that are all over the place, you can balance that out, balance that a bit with some equalizing. I'm seeing abundant and growing pollen stores. Now that may be different after the week we've got coming, but, and then um, you should see that, you should see at least 20 pounds of honey in the second box, four hives that are at least a deep box full of bees or more. And then you should be seeing an actively laying queen. This time of year, I'm gonna just go ahead and I'm gonna say it at this point. If you don't see eggs and larvae in your hive, they're queenless. You should be seeing at this point, you should be seeing at least some eggs and larvae in your hive. Not doesn't have to be a frame full, but you should at least be seeing some patches of eggs and larvae in your hive. Now, um, I'm gonna take that back after this cold front. If you've got a weak hive that went through the cold front we're about to have and couldn't get out and forage for a week, they may have cannibalized those eggs and larvae. But we've had warm weather for the past couple of weeks and we've got warm weather for the next four days or so. There should be eggs and larvae in your hives. And if you don't have that, probably queenless. I would recommend jumping back onto our January webinar recording where we talked about what to do if that happens to you. Okay, so that is uh, more than enough rambling from me. Um, James and Sherry are gonna talk about swarm traps. I'm gonna jump into the Q&A. So if you guys have been saving up um, 
all the questions or any mean things you want to say to me about varroa mites, uh, I'll start, I'll uh, jump into the Q&A box and answer any questions. And James and Sherry are going to take over and then I'll jump back in at the end for a few additional things. So James and Sherry, um, you guys take it away. All right, here we are. Uh, hi Blake, hi everyone. Thank you all for attending tonight. Good questions too, y'all yeah. are sending some really good questions. I hope that we're um, typing and not misspelling really bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I, I need a spell corrector. <laughs> we, we answered 69 questions during that. Oh, wow. So if, if we made some errors oh, wow. or if you don't understand something we said, okay. it's kind of pressure point. Like Sherry said, it's like speed dating. It like, is. Like we've ever done that. <laughs> we've not. Right. We've How's not. this? It was swarmed today, wasn't it? It was swarmed today. <laughs> good. That was very good. I thought it was. That was. So it, Blake has been talking, the word swarm has been said a few times. It and uh, one thing that we have noticed, we, we because of our job and, and grandkids, we follow uh, Facebook or social media. And one uh, very hot topic are swarm traps right now. And um, it's very interesting when you see the different um, forms that people do, the different things they do. It's a trap. It's, it's a trap. A trap. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Return of the Jedi. Oh, I my think God. Star Wars. Yeah. It's a trap. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> well, actually, it's not a trap. It's a bait hive. It is. Isn't that funny? It is. It is. So we're not trapping anything. We're giving them opportunity to move into our, yeah. our headquarters, our yeah. new headquarters. You know, swarms are kind of funny. And that if you think about it, there's never been a swarm that wasn't created by a colony of bees that lived in the area that the swarm occurred. Feral colonies or bees from your yard. That's true, bees, somewhere close. Bees don't come in on in the sky and travel miles and miles and miles. They didn't fly They were the roughly plane. a half a mile or closer to yeah. you. And oddly enough, or not oddly enough, but factually, that colony also overwintered yeah. successfully because yeah, yeah. it made a split. Isn't that something? Of itself. To, to that swarm was a split. Yeah. So it overwintered successfully from a colony of bees that existed somewhere in your area and it survived. That's, That's pretty, pretty cool. cool. It is, is cool. Well, we enjoy swarms and I, I I had to put this video. I hope that your internet connection is showing you this. This is one of Blake's videos of a swarm occurring out of a hive box. And it's pretty, um, what, what's the word? Daunting. Daunting. If you're standing there and this is happening, um, we have actually seen swarms fly over us. Um, that's pretty uh, daunting. And our desire is to try to say, come here, let's maybe move you into a nice little cozy home instead of finding a tree somewhere or a neighbor's soffit or moving into a place that may not be conducive for them to survive. So swarm season is about here. There's several aspects that need to happen for swarm season to really, really and truly occur. And one thing let's, is drones. Yeah, let's back up just a second if I can. Oh, sure, sure. Let's explain to those that are not familiar with swarms what's taking place. Yeah, we did drones. answer that as a question earlier. Yeah, um, the, uh, the bees are leaving, but uh, that's in direct response to overcrowding within the colony. And Blake addressed some of the reasons mm -hmm. for over, over, yes. overcrowding. Uh, but overcrowding caused this. They're flowing out. They're going to land in a cluster somewhere close by, mm -hmm. 30 to 50 what, feet away, ideally. But uh, it could be high in a tree. It could be on the ground. It could be a lot of places. But what's happening is they'll cluster outside. And then the scout bees, which are adult bees, experienced foragers, will go out seeking a place for a new location for a home. That's right. And once they come to a consensus, uh, as they come and go and come and go, you may have heard of bee dances. Uh, the bee dance also occurs within that cluster. And once roughly 80% of the scouts come to an agreement where we're going, and hopefully that's in one of our, our swarm bait traps, right. then uh, the colony will take off and reestablish itself. If it was the first swarm, it would be the mother queen from that original colony. Very well said. That's so that's right. kind of where that's kind of what we're seeing here. Yeah, and it and it really truly does take a daughter to be left behind, and that's uh, crowding does it does happen. Uh, that's that's what causes a swarm. But they're going to have to be able to make another queen. So we've got a little bit of time, but we want you to be prepared and be able to 
to make a good swarm trap and maybe you take advantage of something that's flying around needing a home. Uh, this book, we carry this book at the store. Most stores are online. You can order it online. It's really a good book of basic essentials. It kind of gives you just an overview of what is a swarm? What are the principles of a swarm? And what do I really need to know in order to maintain that, either manage it prior to or after? So I encourage you, we encourage you to get this book. It's a, it's a very nice, it's a short read um, and it's it's a good to, to understand how to capture a swarm, you mm -hmm. also have to understand what it is and what they're looking for mm -hmm. when they're making that move. You know, if you think about how a colony of bees can survive from, from one year to the next or one generation to the mm -hmm. next, that one single colony eventually is going to die if it doesn't have some means to propagate or to reproduce. True. So every colony, the very first bee colony, whenever that was, had to have the ability to swarm because it can't just create a new colony. Right. They can make new bees, but not right. a new colony of bees. And that's why beekeepers make splits, right? That's right. Like talked about that too. Timing is everything on putting up a swarm trap. And this is uh, this is kind of a real poor picture of me. I took most of my face out of it because I really was not happy with what we had found. <laughs> and that was a swarm cell. It was the not an uh, optimal time for us to get a swarm cell. You've never taken that picture. Oh yeah, every time. <laughs> um, but timing is everything when you are putting together your swarm trap um, essentials, for lack of a better word. You're going to want to get your, your ducks in a row. You're going to have your equipment ready. You're going to have your location timed out. We're going to get that going in a second. But you want to make sure that you're not too ahead of the game or too far behind you the know, game. There, there is a peak of the season once there it occurs. Is. And if we start drilling down to when you should have your, your swarm traps out, mm -hmm. it would be prior to your major nectar flow. And before you see that cell right there. Before you see that <laughs> cell, exactly. Um, Sherry was going to say earlier, and I interrupted her about drones. Mm -hmm. uh, once drones have begun to mature within your colony, mm -hmm. whether you're seeing swarm cells or not, uh, or whether you're, you're experiencing cool weather or not, uh, it, it's imminent. Uh, nectar flow is going to be coming mm -hmm. as soon as the weather calms down. Mm -hmm. So timing is everything. Right, it is. All right, so location, location, location. We hear that in real estate. It's kind of the same for swarm traps. And um, you really and truly want to pick your pick your place accordingly. Tree lines are of an optimal location. Bees like a place to orient themselves. And you can often find swarms gathering in trees along tree lines. So it stands to reason you would put a swarm trap in a tree line area. And that, that's true. It is. Water source or natural um, like ri rivers, uh, creeks that are not ever going to dry up, they, they want a water source nearby. So having your swarm trap located near a water source. Well, that stands to reason because there wouldn't be bees there in the first place to be caught by a swarm if they didn't have adequate forage and water. That's so true. So true. Good point. Uh, places known to have had swarms in the past. I liked this because I, I read a story about a guy that had bought some property and apparently it was acreage and he um, had, had some swarm traps out and all of a sudden on this one location, particular location on this property, he was catching swarms left and right and come to find out 40 years prior, the people who owned the property had had bees in the location where he was catching all those swarms. So really and truly that old adage that bees seek out an area where bees live even 40 years later, this guy really and truly proved it right. He, he was standing on a, on a mountaintop saying, this works. I, I promise if you can find a place that there, bees have been before, you're going to find swarms. There, there's so much discussion that can be had about that. And that we, we've seen pictures where or have heard stories where a swarm had landed on the bumper of a car <laughs> or a yeah. truck, whichever it was. Right. And uh, the, the guy took care of it, however it was, collected them, had someone come out. And uh, the very next day, Another swarm came and landed on that car, same spot. and he thought he was jinxed, and we thought he was blessed. <laughs> right. The same thing, and we see it occur over and over and yeah. over. That once you have a hot spot, don't let it get cold because what's present there is an off pheromone, that's and that's right. that's what our bees are being attracted that's to. That's right. That's right. Another location is near your apiary or somebody else's. 
So I, you know, not that you're taking their bees. If their bees swarm, their bees swarm. So, so they're up for grabs, right? So if you want to put them in near your apiary, it's not that you're capturing your swarms because you're gonna manage your colonies, you're gonna do splits and you're gonna not have swarms, but your bee yard may attract swarms. So keep a swarm trap in your or near your bee yard or near others if you feel like you can get by with that. We have had and heard stories of also of swarms landing on beekeepers' heads while they're working their bees. <laughs> I actually have a picture of you with a swarm on your Dur head. During the peak of swarm season, which by the way, there's no license required for swarm season. Uh, there is not. Uh, that's a joke. There is not. Uh, <laughs> so once swarm season hits, it's, it's too late. Well, it's not too late, but it tells you. Yeah. Time to happen. Well, and swarm season can last all summer. It's it's really and truly there's not a it's a season of expansion of bees. It's the expansion of the brood nest, whether it's in a tree or in a box that a beekeeper manages. Um, it's all season, so it's all summer. So be prepared. Well, we Perfect. talked about tree lines. We could also talk about right of ways, power line right of ways. Oh, yeah. We could talk about. Um, I'm sorry, I jumped this slide too. We quick. could talk about uh, on the edge of a river. Mm -hmm. uh, any place that you have a flat area with a, a swarm is an amazing event with a lot of bees, mm -hmm. thousands of bees, and it takes a lot of space. Mm -hmm. So they're not just darting in and out of, of the yo ponds and the mesquites. They're flying above them and they're looking for a flat path. So that's what we're looking for. We want to attract them in the areas that they're flying two and three. That's true. All right. So you see these pictures that we've got on here. Um, and these are basically store bought versions, but not to make this the be all end all, I've seen some pictures of people getting very creative with just regular pots, but these are the most commonly used. I call the top left one a peat pot because <laughs> it looks like a peat pot to me. You called it, what did you call it? It's just a swarm just trap, a fiber. fiber pot, yeah. um, but it's a two piece um, and it's large. It's, uh, you can't see, but it's like what? Like 18 inches, maybe 20 inches. It's a big size, uh, big, it's big, a really big. Well, we have full size pictures of it on our TBS website. We do, we do. Um, and I put how we've hang, hung it, um, ours right beside it, but we'll get to that in a second. I just want you to see what that picture does. And that's important because some people are going, what, what are they that? doing? They're yeah. hanging it wrong. Right. Well, we'll discuss that in a minute. Well, <laughs> wrong or right. Um, the top right is a pro nuke box. If you order your bees from Texas Bee Supply, your nukes, they're going to come in that cute little reusable box. And I'm going to tell you what, that is a super swarm trap box. That box is laced with, with a propolis. It is. It's got spilled laced. honey in it. It's got wax in it. It's got, it's the, got smell. the smell of a queen bee, it does. Of, of all the ages of bees. It it's, does. Got, it's got the, the, uh, the, the pheromones. It's just incredible. It is. Awesome it's, trap. It's, it's pre-baited. Pre-baited. Pre and one of, the, one of the most beneficial things about that is that uh, if you're using a Langstroth style mm -hmm. uh, way of, of keeping bees, mm -hmm. it holds frames. It does. So if you were to attract, attract a, a swarm mm -hmm. to that nuke box, it's ready to be transferred it into to your deep, box. your eight or 10 frame. Yeah. The bottom right picture is a wooden nuke box, um, very easily attached to the side of a tree. We've done this multiple times with nuke boxes. Um, they work very, very well. Bottom left is a full size hive body. Um, the picture that's attached with it is one that we have installed and it works as well. Whatever you desire to use as a swarm trap that it just needs to be something the bees would want to live in. We think the word trap means something that we're trying to trick them into doing, but really what we're trying to do is just give them a place they want to live. That's what attracts them is the place they want to live. And that's really important because the, the survival rate of swarms is, is, is deceptively oh, yeah. low. It's amazing how, how few swarms actually survive. So true, so true. So now let's install it, okay? How high are we going to install I'll tell you it? what, that's pretty high for a 10 frame deep box. It if is. a swarm moves into that, it's pretty heavy. It is. What we had there was we had a, 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 a fiber pot hanging up there that had caught a swarm. Yeah. And I didn't have a second one. So, uh, so, I, <laughs> so I threw that box up there so I didn't miss catching the next swarm. And sure enough, you can see it. Can you see it? They're in did. there. They sure did. When it's hot, it's hot. Take it advantage is. of it, regardless. If you have to put a trash can up there, don't <laughs> let a hot spot get Go cold. Away. That's right. That's right. So how high was that? I think that one was about seven, six or seven feet off the ground. It was. It was completely uncomfortable. It was so heavy. Yeah. Uh, the original, the original hive that was there, 
was one of the peat pots. Don't, I, give, don't give it away. I'm going to talk about that in a okay. second. Uh, and if, if, we'll, we'll wait. We'll wait. <laughs> but I, <laughs> the, how high? There's really not a rule. I can tell you that James looked into this. I looked into this. We put them, what, six feet off the ground and 20 feet up in a tree. Well, we know there's no rule because swarms are caught on the ground. Swarms can move into your shed or, yep. or in your barn where you've got your leftover boxes laying on the ground. Right. Uh, six feet, 10 feet, 12 feet. Our preference is to stay off of ladders. Uh, our days of climbing ladders to get swarms out of a tree or to hang boxes are gone. Yeah. So let that be a good consideration <laughs> for you. Gone. Yeah, just where you're comfortable. And, and I, think that's, I think that's the bottom line is wherever you're comfortable. It, it could be even higher, but if you're not comfortable being on a ladder higher, because you do have to attach it to a tree which leads us to the next slide. So you are attaching this to the tree and, and we uh, borrowed some, um, I'll say slides from the internet to accompany ours so that y'all could see exactly what we are talking about. So the one on the left is uh, what I'm gonna say is James's favorite way. He just makes like an L bracket with a little bracer cleat on it and attaches it to the tree. And it works very well as a, as a, as a stand. So you can really work the, the re rebating it and so forth. It works well for the new box or the full size high body. It does. And regardless of what size box, it, it, the it same does. concept works it does. well. It's a ledge, it's a ledge. So that middle picture is uh, called the French cleat method. And we saw this, I took this, Rich Beggs posted this on the Texas Friendly Beekeepers Facebook page. And I couldn't find the source of the picture. So Rich, if you made the picture, I gave you at least credit for posting it because I couldn't find the source of the actual drawing. Um, I think this is cool. If you can, attract, um, it's really simple. I don't know the wood terminology, but it's just two angles. Uh, that sit together. Well, if we have the opportunity to to walk up underneath the swarm trap and just push it up and remove oh, yeah, it yeah. and not have to take a chain off of around the tree right. or in the case to the left, which I use, the straps like mm -hmm. that, uh, what a great idea. It if is. you know that it's not going to blow off, it's mm -hmm. a great way to secure one to a tree. It really is. I, I thought it was neat as well. And then the one on the right, I got off the honeybee suite. Um, it's just that peat pot that we talk about. And now he hung his uh, horizontal. We most installations show doing it horizontal, horizontal. putting a cap on yeah. it and or, or a, a piece of plywood right. or whatever it may be, and hanging it on the tree sideways. Right. Uh, now I don't know that there's a right or a wrong, but my personal preference is, is vertical. Right. And here's an example of how well vertical can do. Yeah. And you'll know well, you won't be able to see it, but those lobes perfectly match the ribs that are on the bottom side of that, of that, of that lid. lid. Yeah. Uh, so to me, that says that which, which it wants way? to be hung, yeah. hung that way. Mm -hmm. and, and I love it. All of ours are hung that way as opposed to, to, to sideways. sideways. But up to yeah, you though. it's up to you. And this, uh, this guy stuck some little branches out. I thought that was cool. I thought that Decoration. was cool. Well, it makes it look like a tree. <laughs> camouflage. It's <a> camouflage. It's <laughs> camouflage. Is that a pretty awesome? swarm that grew into that tree yeah on, on that uh that bait hive on, yeah. the, on the peak pot it was we're going to show I, another picture of it in a minute he wants so bad to tell you about that i do he's going to get a it. chance in just a second so let's bait that trap all well, right? i did i used swarm commander you did i will <laughs> tell you what i we don't get any money for telling you this but this is good stuff this is good stuff these folks have it figured out of course we sell it at texas bee supply online or at the store it comes in a spray or in this little uh hang tag i think it's called um, a pendant maybe pendant maybe um it is wonderful so with the spray you're going to literally just spray a few squirts that's a technical term up inside your trap, whether that is a hive body or it's the peat pot or it's a nuke box, you're going to just do a couple of squirts. You know, the, the thing about about uh, any type of uh, swarm lure, be it a, a, a lemongrass or lemongrass oil or, mm -hmm. or the uh, swarm commander, the swarm commander and the others, they mimic nasonol, mm -hmm. which is the pheromone that attracts That's right. the, the, uh, the bees to the swarm That's or right. to the box. But the beauty of the Swarm Commander is not only is it just lemongrass oil, mm -hmm. it also has additional oils in it that help it flow and, and accentuate the overall smell. We use it both ways. 
but I prefer the spray bottle. It works yeah. really neat. The, the little hang tag, you just hang in there and it lasts for 90 days. Um, you'll have to reapply the, sport, um, the spray um, every week to 10 days or so, but the hang tag lasts 90 days. It's the, the, uh, the spray or the lemongrass oil, whichever you use in the Swarm Commander, a little bit goes a long way. It does. You can actually repel bees if you over, you go, right. well, if more a little bit's good, better. then, then more has got to be better. More is not well, better. Well, it's not. It is not. I know we did that I think once. on the peat pots, it's recommended it that you get one little squirt inside and one little squirt at the entrance, right. which is a two inch round hole. Right. All right, so the next picture I've got up there is propolis. Um, take any of your traps and take some propolis out of your beehives that you've already got and put a little bit inside there. Just take, I mean, it's soft and pliable uh, for the most part well, on warm it, days. On warm days it can be, but you can also thin it by adding alcohol to it. Oh, that's true. Be that it, is true. you know, if, if you have alcohol for whatever reason, alcohol does thin it. Yeah. And uh, then you can wipe it around your colony, and you really can't you get too trap. You trap. You really can't get too much propolis within a box. You can get too much uh, attractant yeah. sprays, the propolis, but you can't yeah. get too much propolis. Right, and propolis is a bee smell. They're gonna they're gonna love that wax. Um, I think it goes without saying that they can smell wax. Wax smells wonderful. We actually dribble in the top of that uh, peat pot swarm trap. Dribble a little bit on those ribs that are on the lid. It works beautifully as a, not only as an attractant, but also it gives them wax to start building comb. Yeah, I just take a torch and hold it and just, just heat it and let it drip on the line that I want. Mm -hmm. And we also do that same thing to our foundation mm -hmm. if we're using a, 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 a Langster style right. trap. Whether it be a nuke or a full side mm -hmm. box. A lot of folks want to make a foundationless traps. Um, if you want to do that, just cut some starter strips, even out of plastic foundation, just inch, two inches, and glue it in that track of the top bar with wax. So you're getting a double, double benefit there. You're giving them a starter to build that natural comb on, and you're giving them wax to attract them and also to draw some comb out. So that's, that's just some tips to help you bite your back box. So checking back. Checking back. Checking I think that's back. that's where we're headed with. That's why she's wanting yeah, to write. Yeah, no, but no, there's two more slides. Checking so back. Maybe, checking maybe back. We, we need to check back because if we allow a colony to overbuild, to move in, then we have an issue possibly getting them out depending upon what the container is. Right. Watch for scout bees because you'll see if you've got it close and it's near your home or near your bee yard where you are often, you'll see scout bees checking out the entrance, wherever that is on your bait trap. You'll see that, watch for that happening. Reapply the bait once a week. I think I said that a minute ago. You know, watching the scout move, bees move in and experience, mm -hmm. uh, is this an experience that that's, it's hard to forget because it's so much fun to see one, two, three, oh, maybe four of the 12, 15, 20. Right. And, and before you know it, it's quite possible that uh, 20,000 bees are right. going to land right on top Before of it. So it's it. pretty fascinating. Once you do realize that a swarm has moved into your bait trap, give it time. Take a breath and just let them move in. If you go in too soon, you're going to run them off and they're going to say, no, we're out of here. Let them start bringing in pollen. Bringing in pollen is an indicator that the queen is laying. There's enough comb built and that queen has decided this is a great place to stay and I'm gonna lay and they're bringing in pollen so that they can feed babies. We're not, trying to, we're not trying to feed this colony at any no. point at the moment. No. Uh, we don't have sugar water on the bait hive. Mm -mm. The bees have their, their honey stomachs full mm -hmm. when the swarm starts From and they can live off that for about three days yeah. and then they'll, they'll utilize that to begin drawing their comb. That's right. Is that what you were waiting on? That's what I was waiting. You know, we, so, uh, we got busy. You can see that's the same angle that that 10 frame box was installed on a while ago. And that's, right the, that's yeah. the peat pot we were describing earlier without the outer cup or the cover on it. And uh, that colony completely drew itself out. Uh, I think it was like eight, six, seven or eight frames or eight lobes I don't know. that were present there. And uh, while there were no swarm cells on the bottom of that, uh, swarm swarming was imminent. Oh yeah, on, on, that, on that absolutely, and, uh, it was. So we recommend to Holly that she that she he, address your your colony, do something with them before they grow to this point. I can tell you that James was very excited about this. This was uh, this was a find. We had captured swarms in these 
uh, pots before, but this one truly, we got busy. And er, about every day we passed right by it. Our driveway drove right, drove right past it. And we go, we need to get that pulled out. We need to get that pulled out. Well, we, so, thought about, we thought about putting a road sign out, like one of the blue, <laughs> blue uh, historical yeah, markers. So. We had people driving over <laughs> wanting to see that. that yeah, I know. Track, so it cool. was great. But uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's really waiting a little too long. So let's transfer it. Let's, let's watch what James did to transfer that out of that pot into a, its permanent hive home because it's going to have to go to a permanent hive home eventually and that one needed it a few weeks prior to that so as you can see he stood on a ladder now I can tell you that was a four foot ladder so maybe that was higher than about six or eight feet that must have been about 10 or 12 feet because I remember that it was a four foot ladder so he's got his handy dandy little bread knife in his hand and he starts cutting frames I mean, cutting just slicing, the loads. Slicing the, lo the loads off. That's right. And I, you see, I had a place to put it. So we were rubber banding it in. I say we, I was rubber banding we, it I in. I was taking pictures and I was doing other things. Very I was important helping stuff, that's it. right. Yeah, I was doing important stuff. But you literally just take, uh, out of the pot method, you're just going to take, just like you were doing a, a cutout for those that do um, a swarm removals that have moved into structures. You just take each one of those comb lobes and cut it out and then cut it specifically the size of the frame and rubber band it in or wire it in and put it into a hive body like what is shown here on the back of our golf cart. Um, if you've already got, uh, and we were saying this earlier, if you've already got a nuke box and that's what your uh, hive bait trap was, then just need to install it into a full size deep like the box shown here. You know, I think the takeaway from those last few pictures is that waiting too long to do something about a colony that's moved into a, a beta swarm trap mm -hmm. just means more work for you. It does. It was and more it work. Does, it is disruptive to the colony. So once you see they've moved in, like Sherry was saying, and the pollen's coming in, mm -hmm. you can be sure the queen's laying. And there's probably a fairly small amount of uh, brood, brood in there now. So it's very easy to transfer that Much into easier. another box. Much easier. Then to have to go through that process that I had to go through there. That's right. But that's you want to avoid. Right. But he was very proud of that one, as you can tell. All right. Our last slide. Treat the newly transferred colony as you would a new colony. Just like you would if it were a new colony, a new split or a new nuke that you've installed in something. You're going to feed it. You're going to feed it. You're going to feed it. You want them to continue to grow because it's it's that time of year, it's spring season. How it's wax created. That's right, with sugar syrup, with, with, nectar, oh, with nectar. With nectar. Right. The second bullet point I think is very important because we've had this question asked many, many times over the years of, well, when do I treat for varroa? Because this was a feral colony, whether it came from someone else's uh, beehive or it came from a tree that swarmed. Um, you well, need it to really- Well, it may not be a feral colony. Well, right, could be. Could yeah. be a, from somebody's box, but sure. regardless, you're not going to want to treat right away. Give it a couple of weeks. Let them settle in. Let them get used to their new their new home, and then do a test to treat for varroa if needed. We've probably all done varroa treatments, or most of us have done varroa treatments when we were maybe on the edge of the parameters mm -hmm. of temperature, mm -hmm. and we saw how the bees were affected, how it drove them out of the box. Mm -hmm. We don't want to drive a new colony like this oh, yeah. out of be, the box. So let's, let's let them build, and and uh, varroa mites, you know, the, wait a little the bit. history is, yeah, they'll wait a little bit they'll because little. their population grows along with the population That's of the right. colonies. So you don't start off with a lot of varroa mites. Right. And the last bullet point is requain. Um, some folks, believe that we don't requeen all, all swarm captures, but most of the time we do. We don't know the genetics of those bees. You're liable to have some um, rather um, feisty bees um, just because the genetics may be of feral population. Well, that brings up a good point though. They uh, swarm colonies or swarms are basically oh, docile, yeah. so we don't know we don't know what their temperament until is until they've built a colony. Until until they have some brood to protect and some honey right. to protect. Some people do like the idea of thinking that if, if if they know that the swarm didn't come from a beekeeper's colony, that it came from the woods, then it's true Strong survival stock. stock, and they like the idea of that queen being there. And uh, that, that's just a thought process. But if you're into uh, producing bees or into producing honey or want to get the most out of your colony, 
then ideally a new queen, queen. would be Well, I mean, first of all, where did that queen, we know she was the older queen, right? She, she's the older queen. She was the mother queen. So she's on her other end of her production. It's just important to, to so. acknowledge that there's other ways to look at That's it. Right. That's right. That's right. So basically we're, we're not trapping bees. We're, we're giving them opportunity to have a new place to live where we can improve their survival chances, yeah. where we can up the quantity of bees that we're wanting to uh, keep within our apiary. And if nothing else, maybe give those bees to somebody else. Right. Um, it's just a, a great opportunity. Don't pass it up and don't wait too long to get your traps out. That's right. Or you'll have one like Jim. <laughs> <laughs> or it'll land on your head. <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay, Blake, it's all yours. Great, thank you guys. And hey, perfect timing. Uh, we are almost at eight. That being said, um, I, I have to share a few more slides and one quick little side note, since you're talking about swarm traps. Um, there was one year that I had an apiary of, it was about, I had about 16 hives, I think in that bee yard. And in one spring between March and May, I caught 50 swarms on the perimeter of that one bee yard. And I knew because I was inspecting weekly that none of those swarms came from my bees. So I had 50 swarms <laughs> attracted to my one bee yard. Never had anything like that again. It's really rare. But bees, as the Elam said, definitely attract bees. Um, if you guys are, if, if any of you live in uh, um, Northeast Texas uh, or Southeast Texas, especially, there's a lot of commercial beekeepers and you'll probably catch some of their wild swarms. Um, if you have uh, bees, any, if you live anywhere in the uh, Blue Ridge or Bonham area of Northeast Texas, of North Texas, um, you can probably catch some swarms from uh, some of our commercial hives. So, um, okay, real quick, um, I'm going to launch a quick poll for you guys. Um, appreciate it if you'd fill it out. Uh, this is asking, are videos shown over Zoom helpful or annoying due to Zoom quality? So this isn't a fun B poll question, but um, you know, we have a lot of videos. I've been trying not to show them because I know they can be kind of jumpy and skippy, um, but I, I don't, I do want to show them if they're helpful uh, to show a video that we're playing over Zoom. So um, awesome. Thank you guys by your answers. Yes, you very much like seeing videos over Zoom. So I will, I'll put not a ton, but I'll, uh, I'll integrate a couple of videos into some future Zooms. And just a little sneak peek, one thing, no promises, because I'm still working it out. Um, and with the, uh, we have to wait till after daylight savings time when it starts getting dark later, but um, ho hopefully tentatively for our April, starting with our April Zoom call, we will actually conduct, fingers crossed, um, a little bit of it out in the bee yard. So the first about 20 minutes, um, we'll start out in the bee yard, actually over Zoom, and then we'll transition to the PowerPoint. So fingers crossed, we're still working out the kinks. But um, last little note here, guys, is a change to registering. You don't have to register every single month anymore. If you registered, if you are on this call tonight and you registered, you don't have to register anymore. We've, we've made this a recurring meeting. Um, and if you register once, then you'll get the registration information or the link will be sent to you one week, one day, and one hour before the call. So if you registered once, no need to register again. So you'll, you'll automatically get the reminders and, and the link every single month. So congratulations. No more registering every time. Don't forget to shoot any questions to us and you'll get that follow-up email in the next couple of days that'll have a webinar uh, direct link to join our March call. Links to products and videos. We'll put links to those sticky boards that we talked about. We'll put links to the swarm commander lure, the swarm traps. Uh, we'll link to all that in the video. And then we'll link to the free Texas Bee Supply monthly magazine as well. So um, with that, we're right on time. Um, that is all we had. But if you have any questions, feel free to hang out and shoot those over to us. And we'll be more than happy to answer them.